to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. Today, I am so honored to reintroduce to you my guest, Susan Winterstein of Savvy Interiors in San Diego. Susan has become a close friend. She was in two of the masterminds that I led with my cousin, Eileen Hahn, and she has also been a previous guest on the show. And one of the results of all of this quality interaction with Susan is that I have developed a genuine respect for her as a strong leader a savvy businesswoman, and I am awed by her drive for excellence. Not only does she run a multi-million interior design business, she is also the founder of the nonprofit Savvy Giving by Design. Savvy Giving by Design supports children in medical crisis by redesigning their rooms to make them functional, supportive, and a fun place to be. Because as Susan told us, so much of their time is spent in their bedrooms. Susan has rallied interior designers from across the country to collaboratively work to create safe, comforting, and healing spaces for children in medical crisis. All of this with running her interior design firm, um, having five daughters and a fantastic husband makes Susan one heck of an outstanding lady. And I'm excited to bring this interview to you. Hi, Susan. Thanks so much for coming back to a well-designed business. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me back. This is great. Well, I have to tell you, um, the very first time that I interviewed you, which which ep- which was episode 164 in the first year of the podcast, I remember thinking, what a dynamo. Like, whoa. <laughs> like, I was just like totally in awe. And what's so funny is we went, I think, three or four years before we ever met each, each other in real life. I mean, wasn't it just like the last like yeah. real market to October 2019 and we walked by each other and I was like, wait, you're Susan. You're like, you're Luann, right? Yep. Yeah, it was. I think I met you uh, at a another conference we went to, I think in passing before I was even on your very first podcast. And I'm oh. like, oh my gosh, there's Luann. I was a little starstruck. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so it was so fun. And then, yes, it was at the last market that we actually, you know, face to face. Yes, yes, yes. And, and there's a lot of road and a lot of journey since then, even though almost none of it has been face to face, we've become great friends. And I yeah. have just learned to have even so much more respect for, um, you, Susan, as a human person, as a business owner, rock star, as a mom, and, and as a wife. I mean, you really, really do hit it out of the park in all areas. I, I really want to just tell you that from the bottom of my heart, and it's what I've observed, and it's been my great pleasure to really get to know you to so well as I've been able to this last year or two. Yeah. Well, you and Eileen have both been so instrumental in our business this whole past year. Um, you know, going from the mastermind that was in the depths of COVID and not knowing <laughs> what was going to happen, um, and then being connected with like-minded designers that were at the level that we were at to have that peer connection, and then even presenting us with someone like Kate O'Hara that was just mm. that next step that we were, uh, you know, gearing towards. It was just so, it's really put us on that path this past year, and I, I was, I've said to you many times, I don't know that we'd be where we are had it not been for some of that roadmap because I certainly didn't have it um, for that second stage of of growing this business. Mm. Well, it's funny because I also want to compliment you because I remember when I was sitting, I was sitting, you know, at, at TV or dinner or something, and I got a direct message from you on Facebook. And mm-hmm. it was literally three, four, maybe I was going to say days, but maybe it was a week or two 
into maybe it was two weeks into COVID, and mm -hmm. I re I got a direct message from you, and you said something to the effect of, "Hi, Luann, it's Susan Winterstein. I have a big business. We were headed for three million, and this COVID has got me." scared out of my wits and I need to be in a room with people like you and others who can help me. Can you put a mastermind together? <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. And and I wanna I bring that out for a couple of reasons because at that point we had done the interview years before and mm -hmm. we had met each other for maybe 15 minutes at that right. point we were not what I would call you know really connected right we, right. we were acquaintances right. and I just remember two things happened in that exact moment I knew that me Vin and Billy had been meeting at that point I think it was our second or third Saturday with Eileen mm -hmm. for exactly that purpose whoa what is happening here? How do we keep the ship on track? What's going to, and so I thought, whoa, I needed it. Of course, you know, Susan, you know, is saying mm -hmm. that she needs it and where does somebody get the help? And then the second thing I thought to myself, for her to step out of her box and really ask me something like that, that was a personal ask, right? It really mm -hmm. was. Um, right. And, and not that you you said, I'll pay you. I'm not saying right. that it was like, oh, you asked me for a personal favor. But I mean, like I said, that level that we knew each other was in passing, was was professional. And I thought, right. wow, that is, a, that is somebody who is intentionally running their business. And you said the words, I didn't come this far to let it slip through my fingers. <laughs> right. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember thinking, who would I go to and who would I trust with mm. something this important? Um, if you know how to get, you know, younger designers launched, then we certainly need that next step. Mm -hmm. Like I knew how to get to where we were, but I didn't know how to get to that next step. And I didn't know how to survive COVID. I didn't know which way it was going to go. It was mm -hmm. going to, I, you know, we had no crystal ball to know that the industry would go insane. Um, but at that time, you know, we were seeing how are we going to navigate? And, and if, for those of us that have been in business long enough, remember 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. uh, we remember recessions. We remember what it was like to be knocking on doors and saying, Hey, I can come design your space. Um, we remember those things. And so just that refresher of like business wasn't just going to naturally come, which of course that's the cool <laughs> irony of this whole thing is that it did, but you know, we were, we were really like, oh my gosh, what would we do? And how are we going to hold on to this? And how are we going to maintain, you know, at that point I had furloughed three quarters of our team mm -hmm. and was down to three support people. And I kept thinking, how am I going to bring them all back if there's, you know, if we're completely shut down in California and for how long? And so knowing, you know, I've always said to my team, you know, I don't, I don't need you to know all the answers. I really don't. I just need you to know where to go and look for them. Mm. And that was really, you were one of those people, which is, okay, I, you know, if it wasn't you, you would know someone. Right, you know, right. Do this. So can we just please do this? <laughs> I know you know. <laughs> and I know I need to know what you know. So um, I knew that much. And so that was really the prompt for it. And I was so thrilled when you said yes so well I, I really I literally I remember sitting there and I just thought of course yes it's one yeah. thing if you're in business a minute or three years or whatever and you know it's scary but I knew what we were doing at Window Works we we were the same yeah. thing we were headed towards three right when that happened three million and all of a sudden we had a month where we did you know a tenth of the sales, not yeah. anywhere near the cost to be open number. And I thought, oh, yeah, I know exactly what she's feeling like. And yes, let me step up and let me help. And then I reached out and found, um, you found two or three. I found two or three. I said, okay, yep. you get some, I'll get some. Let's get six yep. or eight of us in a room and let's let's do this. And of course, I invited Eileen to do it with us because she brings a whole, yep. like, we're the boots on the ground, right? We, we are, right? we're the women that have run a business. We know what it's like. It's not a minute. It's it's. 
20, 30, 40 years, whatever it is. And, but Eileen has that experience at that, you know, 10, 20, $30 million and above level of businesses. And she just, I just knew that her participation in it would positively impact all of us. And I believe it did. Do you as well? Oh, she was uh, instrumental. I mean, I never really considered just in, uh, in hiring alone. I had never truly considered what it meant to have the most exceptional top 25% for your particular job that you're mm. hiring for. Um, you know, just from a, a skill set, innately what people are good at, how they feel good in their job, how they can perform in their job. And it never really, I mean, you always, you know, I don't know when I was very, very new in business, like somebody wanted to come work for me. I was so thrilled. I'm like, really, you want to work for me? Like, <laughs> that's like, such you honor. breathe Thank and you, you smile. You know? Come on over. <laughs> yeah, come on. Great. And then as you know, I had been doing this for a while and I had been with certain employees for years, some of them years, it really became apparent, like how much energy they were taking from me that was being diverted from the things that I needed to do to grow the business and to be in it there in a different way and show up in a different way. And once I was able to really truly identify what those things were that were holding me back and the positions that I needed to fill and what skill set was going to be the most efficient in that job and not only make me happy, but make themselves happy mm. and have a good positive workplace. That was the first time I'd really truly been introduced to that next level of hiring mm. and what that meant and predictive index and what that meant. And testing people for certain skills and going through that whole interview process and as you know looking at your business as a whole and how it's going to function and then getting that middle management piece and I mean it was don't get me wrong this last year was painful <laughs> painful um, and I mean there was so much movement in the industry and so much lateral movement and up and down and around and sideways and out on their own and everything it was painful but I can honestly sitting here today know that it's been worth it mm. um, and that growth wouldn't have happened. Um, you know, sure, we'd have more business, but I would be probably in an insane asylum right now. <laughs> You'd be out in a corner the- licking your wounds like yeah, out of your right. mind. <laughs> so the fact that I'm like standing and can like feel proud that I can leave on vacation for 10 days and I know like it's going to be fine, right? Um, that people have it covered and that I've got good, competent people in those roles is huge. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say it's not stressful still. It's a crazy, we all know it's a crazy time in the industry, but um, it is, um, I'm, I'm glad to be standing in the space that I am today than where I was, you know, a year and a half ago. So mm. I agree. Yeah. And the thing is, that is the, the gift of Eileen. And yeah. we're talking about Eileen Hahn and I'll put her episodes that she's been on in the show notes. And of course, she's been one of the co-authors in both Power Talk Friday experts. And of course, she is my beloved cousin. Um, but the thing is, that is her gift. And what was so, I think, interesting uh, between you and me in our experience, we did this mastermind and we said, okay, an emergency mastermind, eight weeks. And then when it was done, you said, no, 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 no. I, I, I'm not done with you ladies. Like, please don't tell me it's it's over, right? And so then we did it for another six months yeah. together, right? But um, the thing about it was that was interesting in in learning about your business at such an intimate level, you were literally just one step behind where we were at window works. And I just kept thinking anytime you would say something, I would say, yeah, I remember thinking that just last year. I remember that was uh, the things that Eileen would, would implore us to do. And I watched you push back here and there. No, no, it's a great lady. She's been with me all these years. And Eileen just uh-huh. looking at you with the most love that she possibly can. Cause when she uh-huh. looks at you, it's like the sun shines on you, isn't it? Uh-huh. <laughs> right. Yeah. And she'd be uh-huh. like, but Susan, you know, she's not as happy as she could be if she's, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, you've got to let people be in their spot. And I just remember always like, it's that it's what I would, the big lesson that we had had the year before, because Eileen has been coaching us individually at Window Works for years. And the big lesson that we went through the year before was the things that got you 
to 2 million are not the things that will get you to five. They are not. Exactly. They are not. Exactly. They're, it's a whole different skill set. It's just it like, is. whoa. And you think when you run a business at 2 million, especially if you do it for multiple years, you think you, know, you, think you got it. You think you know who you think you are, right? Yeah. And yeah. then all of a sudden, whether it's by your own design that you start to build out the company a little bit and stretch a little further, or it's like this where it was the um, you know pandemic creating it, all of a sudden it's, it's the things that you did as an ownership, you know, either a team like us or a leader like yourself, you're just like, that didn't work. Like that didn't work. Like what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, she's been instrumental in, in that for us as well is, um, that constant harking to, are you hiring exceptional people? She always says right. to me, are you, are, are you settling here? Like, what is that about? Like, do you come up and do you show up halfway, Lou? And I'm like, well, no. And she goes, right. So no one around you should show up halfway. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those little pearls of wisdom that you stop and you reflect and you're like, oh, shoot. Yeah, I got to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a kick in the pants. I mean, literally, it's like uh, it really gets you thinking and gets the wheels turning of, oh, yeah, I need to pay attention to that because you're right. It's a completely different business mm -hmm. going to that next level when you know that you're a step removed and you have to get rid of a lot of control and you got to, you know, you've got to control it in a different way. It's just a different mm -hmm. pathway. And, uh, and it was so... Yeah. Um... Uh, it was so uh, enlightening, mind expanding, uh, enjoyable, reassuring to mm -hmm. work with the whole group and see that s you, we all experienced similar things, but then we were all at different stages of it. And so, like, mm -hmm. if you remember Anastasia, Anastasia Harrison, who is also a design is a designer here in New Jersey, she was part of our group. And if you remember. She had reached out to me the year before, after October 19 market. I met her at a monogram event and we hit mm -hmm. it off. And she reached out to me like three weeks later and she says, I want to coach with you. I said, okay, what's going on? She said, I want to um, build out my marketing. I'm sick and tired of this, you know, 1.8 sort of thing. I want to go to three and four and five million. And I know I got to do marketing. So we end mm -hmm. up chatting and at 15 or 20 minutes and I said to her, I said, no, no, you don't need my help marketing. You need to go work with Eileen and you need to get your team straightened out. Oh, I might do that too, but you know, it's the marketing. And I said to her, I, I said, no, because here's the thing. You don't have the foundation to, right. for us to build this marketing. I said, if I work with yeah. you and we increase your marketing, you're going to fall on your pant, your, your, your butt. I, you're right. going to watch you do it. I know it. And she, right. and I remember, and you know, she's from Jersey, so she's not really like, okay, thanks. She's like, no, I think this, and I'm <laughs> like, listen to me. I'm like, I will not coach you. I'm like, you have to at least do a discovery call with Eileen. And if you don't want to hire her, don't, but I'm telling you, this is not your problem. It's not. And I said to her, if you get your team squared away, I guarantee you, you'll hit 3 million because you will be all working in harmony now. And so right. she had done that process in the six months previous to our mastermind. So when you would be a little bit like, I don't know, she would be like, Susan, do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Just get your yeah. team reorganized. Yeah. It is. And so it was such a, um, it was such a beautiful experience. How, like, I feel that way. Do you feel that way? Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. yeah, no. And it's just, even having her today, um, she's been a great resource. We trade texts all the time mm. and uh, send each other, you know, what do I do here? What do I do there? And can reaffirm a lot of what we learned, you know, and reaffirm that for each other, which has been a, a just a tremendous relationship. Well, all the women in that group were pretty dynamic. So um, they were all such a, you know, me, I'm always on that group and, and still tapping into their oh, knowledge no. thing. So, yeah. yeah, no, it's great. I mean, great. we had Sandra Funk and Tracy Connell and Robin Burrell and, and you, and then Jennifer Fuller joined us for the second yeah. part of it. Um, it was really, it was a, it was a, a very it was a good group. Yeah. It was a great group and it was a great experience. And, um, you know, it was funny cause I think we all gave as much as we got and it was really something, yeah. but you know, I brought it up because there were huge lessons in that. Like I said, the one lesson to, to your point, you 
don't always have to know the answer, but you have to be willing to go find the answer and you have to be willing to search for it and ask for it. The second you can, you can find it, but you got to use your voice and ask for it. And I just thought that was such a great thing that you did. And the point is that somebody listening might need something right now and figure out who's the place to get it. Maybe it's a, a designer bestie. Maybe it's a, you know, your, your father is a great entrepreneur, your mother, you know, just you, ask because someone can yep. say no, but they ne- they can't say yes if you don't give them the shot, right? Exactly. And there's so much information. It's really up to you to take all of those suggestions and then make the decisions of how you're going to move forward. Mm-hmm. And that's that second step, right? As you gather as much information as you can, you get all the pieces and then you wait it according to how much you trust that individual source. And then you just You just do it. Mm -hmm. You just get down to work and do it. And there you go. You just do it because this is the other Mm -hmm. thing. You know, you have to always be willing to invest in yourself. And this is one of my, one one of the interesting ah ahas of doing the podcast all these years is I remember in the first five or six months and I was having a lot of interviews with outside industry experts. I always do, but much more in the beginning, right? And I would interview guys like Jim Riviello and Tom Corley, and they're, they're, they're authors and they're huge guys in the business world. And off air, they would say things to me like, oh, you know, um, you'd be a great in our mastermind. And I was like, what, what do you mean? And he's like, oh yeah, we have a mastermind. It's 25K a year to join, or it's 50 50K a year to join. And in the beginning, I'm telling you, Susan, it knocked me down. I was like, what? But (laughs) when you hear over and over again that people that are succeeding in their industries at the highest levels and they are bringing Mm -hmm. their A game, they are always looking for other ways to get people that they admire, they respect, they trust to your words in their ear and helping them see the things that they wouldn't see on themselves. And so now I swear to goodness, I think I have seven coaches now. I'm like, yeah, I'm all about coaches now. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? As long as like you said, uh, you, you vet them, you trust them, you know that they are proven, they have a track record. Um, But yeah, you just don't get beyond your you, look you can be the brightest person on the world you just don't know everything <laughs> you exactly. just don't right nor do you have to there's so much information out there for discovery it's just finding the right people to ask and like you said the right people to trust mm-hmm. and that's just such the unfortunate part of our um uh, things out there you just have to know the right people to trust mm-hmm. and that's the hard part yeah. um but yeah, there's a lot, there's all sorts of ways of resourcing information that's going to get you to that next level. It's so good. So good. All right. Now, now you're going to update me. First mm-hmm. of all, um, when you first came on, you told me about Savvy Giving by Design. And I just was really just so impressed at what you had created and you were, you said, Hey, I would love to have, um, designers that are interested, start chapters around the country. And of course, since then you have now grown to 15 chapters. Anastasia's got a chapter. I know Kylie Ponton, Jessica Deuce, Caitlin Waite, um, Janelle Fotopoulos, Jennifer Moore. There's others. We're going to, I'm going to forget some of the names, but uh, several of them I've interviewed on the podcast about their starting a savvy giving. And I remember you said to me, you you know, I would love to have one in every state. And how is it now, seven years later, five years since I've met you on that podcast, but seven years since you started this, is is that still a an expectation or a dream? Where are we at with that now, Susan? I think that will always be a dream. I think just like running a business, running a nonprofit and seeing the growth, you know, you have different life cycles of a business and a nonprofit and nonprofits certainly have different life, uh, you know, uh, growth cycles. So when you're new, it's fresh, everybody's super excited and you're jumping on board and it's a real grassroots effort and you're learning. You're learning how different from your business to run a board run nonprofit that's all volunteer based and you're trying to put good out into your community, into your world. And you kind of learn like what works and what doesn't. And I've been fortunate enough in that 
because I have strong community roots um, in San Diego, California, I was able to tap into those resources, both clients and friends and community members that wanted to help with our mission. And so it always came very easy to me to raise money, to have fundraising. But after a couple of years, you know, you know, you're still there and you're still raising money. We've done okay. We've had our galas, we've had our fundraisers. COVID certainly put, you know, th- made things much quieter. You know, we didn't have our big gala. We didn't have our big events like we would normally have. And so some of our timelines slowed a little bit. Um, But then we started experiencing this growth with these chapters and Kylie's done a fantastic job in Florida Mm. in uh, growing her nonprofit and has a lot of resources. All of our chapters have done phenomenal and have contributed to doing kids spaces. One of the recurring thing themes that has come up over the last few years is how running a business and then also being involved in this nonprofit and the ongoing fundraising burden that comes along with um, running your own independent 501c3. Um, not a, a challenge that you can't overcome. It certainly um, it depends on how much time and energy is put into it, but it does create another level or another layer, I will say, to running a nonprofit. Um, COVID, certainly everybody kind of retreated a little bit. Um, There was not as many public outings and public doing things together. So our networks kind of disintegrated a little. Um, I would say that um, my goal is to get into as many rooms as possible, whether it's a chapter or, um, you know, individual designers volunteering their time to do rooms for kids in a medical crisis. I would say that we piloted a pop-up program probably a year before COVID hit, Mm. um, so probably three years ago now, and we did a room out of Chicago. Um, We had a designer that was local to Chicago area who volunteered to come and do the room, and so we wanted to kind of try it out, dip our toes in the water, and see how that was going to work. And um, it worked out great. Um, And then after that, we kept opening chapters and then COVID. Now we're kind of reintroducing this pop-up designer program for a few reasons. Uh, We've become aligned with Make-A-Wish nationally. Mm. So many of our chapters have aligned with our local Make-A-Wish chapter. So Make-A-Wish, their nonprofits are structured just like ours are. Each of those nonprofits are all independent independent 501c3s in those states, um, just like we are, and they all operate under the group exemption of the national Make-A-Wish chapter, like the Savvy Giving by Design chapters operate under ours. Um, They have seen a huge increase or uptick in room makeover requests. People aren't going to Disney World. They're not going on family vacations. Um, A lot of these children that are in a medical crisis are really relegated to home. If anybody can understand what that feels like, I think we can all identify now Mm. with these children Mm. that have been stuck at home Um, because these kids are not doing it just during a quarantine period. These kids are doing it for a year or two. Mm. Uh, They don't have the ability to come and go and go to birthday parties or go swimming in a, in a swimming pool. Um, Their lives really revolve around either being at the hospital, a clinic or being in their homes. So we are kind of bridging that gap between the increase in room makeover requests that Make-A-Wish is getting. Make-A-Wish funds that primary child space our pop-up designers would come in and do the design for that space. And then our national chapter would help to grant a matching donation to that designer to help do the sibling spaces. Mm. So there's a lot in there, but suffice to say, we are gathering our Rolodex of pop-up designers and we're training them on the way that we do things on the way that, uh, how we make over the rooms. It's a little bit different than a typical client. And once they're trained, then we put them into our system and then we partner up with the Make-A-Wish in their area and we align those two groups together so that when Make-A-Wish gets a room request, they have those designers to tap into locally that can come help them with the design. So loving all of this. And let me just see if I'm picking up and understanding it clearly. So, and and also I realized, you know, we started just the way we started where we know exactly what we're talking about. Right. right. And there's some people that haven't heard the first episode. So just 
for us, I'm going to ask my question, but but state the mission of Savvy Giving by Design with its full explanation. I just realized, sure. you know, we're halfway yeah. in the middle of a conversation and I hadn't set the stage properly. Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree. Uh, so Savvy Giving by Design is a 501c3 nonprofit. It's a network of professional interior designers that make over children's spaces that are facing a medical crisis. Uh, most at no cost to the family. Uh, most often it's cancer, but it can be brain tumors, paralysis, uh, special needs, um, anybody that's facing a crisis at that time. What our mission is, is to go in and create a healing space. So um, you know, there was a researcher, Don Ulrich, that said that, you know, healing space can contribute, well, a, a well-designed space can contribute up to 30% of our healing. So if we are operating under that assumption, we're going in and we're really addressing all of the things that are going to help that child heal in that, heal in that room. And w the thing what you do, though, is Savvy Giving takes it a step further and you always do the sibling's bedroom as well. We do, um, and that, that was one of the things that we've worked out with Make-A-Wish, which has been great. They've been very agreeable to this. Um, Make-A-Wish's uh, primary focus is on the primary child. Uh, we believe that the identified child in a household that is facing a medical crisis often is the recipient of a lot of these different types of things, um, and they need the most support, obviously. Um, but we also think that siblings get a little bit lost in that sometimes mm -hmm. and that they don't really know where they fit in. Mom and dad are fairly occupied with maybe medical decisions and care teams. So they have grandparents and cousins coming in to kind of bridge that gap. And they, they're worried about their sibling, but they kind of have these irrational feelings of, well, like, why is he getting a whole new room? And I still don't even have a mattress. You mm -hmm. know, you can't. You can't walk by a child's room when they don't even have the basic needs mm. um, and and just be focused on the one that is ill because you want to make them that whole group dynamic, right? You want them all fighting for the same mm. thing, which is the, the health and wellness of their sibling. So we want to include them in that process and we do a modified makeover um, for their rooms. So it may not be with the intensity that we do the primary child. Um, so for instance, a primary child space, we're looking as designers at what is the flooring material? Is it safe? Is it waterproof? Do we have solid surface to remove, you know, carpet and allergens? Um, is the light control good? Do we have a dimmer switch on there? Do we have ventilation? Do we have a good um, uh, germ control, soft corners, edges? Maybe for the sibling space, that's not as big of a priority. Maybe what we need to do for the sibling space is focusing more on some lighter renovations. Like maybe there's some colors they want to paint their room and new bedding and they want, um, you know, some fun toy storage solutions or something for their space. So we do a modified makeover for their room just to kind of freshen it up and mm -hmm. give them a fresh perspective for their new normal. And then in addition, we're looking at the primary child's room in a different way. Right. And, and I love that. And it, and it's so true because um, it was funny. It wasn't funny. I say that like this is like the word that's come out of my mouth. After I met you, it was um, after we did that first interview, a couple of years after that, my niece was diagnosed with leukemia and she had not yet turned five, I believe. And mm -hmm. we got the word the day after Thanksgiving and it was just like, whoa. And yeah. she was one of the lucky ones. And they literally sat and they told my, it was my, it's my great niece. So they literally sat and told our niece and our nephew, um, they explained to them what this would look like. And basically within a week, they explained if she hits all the markers if all the things happen the way they're supposed to happen in two and a half years she will go back to school because she was in kindergarten I get to I guess maybe she had just turned mm -hmm. five she will go back to school like this is if she hits everything and but I remember my brother and sister-in-law who were their grand the grandparents uh, you know to your point they were the ones often picking up the little brother or the everything had to be at the house mm -hmm. but you know they couldn't come to the holidays and every more because of worrying about the contamination and a, a simple cold that any one of us might be carrying could be devastating to mm -hmm. our niece, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the, I just... The, the, what you say is so true. The needs of the, of the child that is in that situation, in that condition, are one. But then there are needs for the sibling as well, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, they do. They, they need a little bit of that reassurance. And, and I think what a lot of people, especially in the cancer community don't understand is when a child like that, who's going through chemotherapy, um, it's really there, obviously chemotherapy knocks down their immune system. So they, they have what's called an ANC, which is a really low count. Like they, they go back and get tested for their ANC. So if they stub their toe on something or they cut their finger, they don't have our, uh, you know, the ability the rest of us have to fight it because mm. it's so depleted. If they get an infection and they have to treat that infection because they do get sick, it delays the next chemotherapy infusion. So what happens is that gives a chance for those cancer cells to come back. Oh. So really you don't want to get an infection during that time. That's why they're so paranoid because then they won't get their next cancer treatment mm. uh, because they can't do both. They've got to fight the infection first, knock that down, get you back up to a minimum ANC so that you can go back and have another infusion. So all of those things. And, and I certainly think that that parallel right now with COVID, you know, we're also worried about going out, you know, infecting others and how that affects other people, how we're going to, if we're going to get infected, being out in public, we've all are hyper vigilant about, you know, we have to go into a store and you're wearing a mask, you know, in some state still. And I mean, there's, there's, we certainly went through that for a year and a half. So imagine doing that for two and a half years with a child I know. who I know. just wants to go to the birthday party I know. and who just wants to see and hang out with their siblings or go see family for the holidays. I mean, that is so compromised. And so we really, if we all have looked around our houses over the last two years and go, Ooh, I really want to do this house project. Like 90% of the people out there <laughs> right now, um, uh, you can appreciate how it is for a kid who's stuck home and you're trying to create not only a place for them to heal and rest, but also to play. And so each of the rooms have to have some sort of element of play in them. They have to have mm -hmm. some sort of creative outlet, whether that's a reading area or an art center or, you know, a little, um, you know, gaming area for them. You know, we're always trying to create that and something that they can do with their siblings because we found that when we do design a room, and they do have friends over when they are feeling good or they do have family over that if you have a well-designed space, your friends and family stay longer. Mm. They come over and they want to be in the room. Mm. They want to hang out longer and they get more of that social interaction with others and they don't feel quite as isolated and their old room isn't reminding them of how they used to be, mm. right? Like how they used to function. So mm -hmm. you're giving them kind of a new normal, a new fresh start to fight and feel different in their space. And so then they also don't have to feel guilty if their siblings are not getting the same things they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, their siblings, they still feel proud. I've seen so many children that have been so excited to see their sibling spaces because they're so happy that they were able to have that little bit of control over their siblings getting a new bed or new mm -hmm. bedding or on their walls, you know, that like that whole, like, we're all in this together kind of a thing. I love that. I love that you've, because you, you said that a moment ago, and it's so, it's so true. And it's such, it's what the family needs at that time. It needs everybody pulling together because at any given day, I just think back to the experience of my nephew and his wife and their experience. Any given day, somebody is probably doing pretty good and somebody is probably having a really hard day. And so, yeah. you know, you just, you, you, yeah. you hope that you don't have the hard day all on the same day. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but you do need somebody to always look around and find something to be grateful for, to get you all to that next little day moment, you yeah. know, whatever it is. Right. And we are, we are such a small part, a small sliver of their overall journey. But I think what I've come to appreciate over the years is um, we get to kind of bring the joy and the light, you know, we mm. get to bring the fun stuff. Mm. So everything has been so centered around making medical decisions and really as professional designers, our job is to go in there and make those decisions for them and do a space that um, is a little bit of a surprise to them that they don't have to make all those decisions. And that's what I say when I mean that it's, it's different than working with your typical client. It's a lot more freedom in a lot of ways, and it's a lot more satisfying in a lot of ways. Um, but it's just a very different process um, in designing a room for a child um, and for a family when it is at no cost to them. And you get to come in and be creative and do things like we don't 
we don't share with the kids what we're doing. We don't share with the family how what we're creating. We get to come in there and just do a really good design discovery process with them to figure out what it is that they want, how it's going to function. And then we go in and kind of put a, we're one and done. Like we come in and do the install once and we don't come back. That's mm. it. And so, um, you know, the less they know, the better. And it gets to be that real kind of aha surprise moment. But um, they 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 love that because it's something they get to look forward to. It's something that they all get super excited about and amped about. And, um, you know, they are just thrilled to walk into their new rooms. And from a practical standpoint, that just hit me between the eyes. Mm-hmm. From a practical standpoint, look, I remember, I mean, pre-COVID times, you were turning a room around, two rooms around every six weeks. I mean, yeah. I remember you're telling me that. And yeah. that's beyond comprehension, knowing that you're running a huge firm alongside of doing this, right? So, mm-hmm. um, you know, what what do you have, eight or 10 or 15 people working for you in your design firm? Um, right. At that point, I don't know how many, but I know recently. And so the thing is, from a very practical, how do we get this done standpoint, what I heard you just say is we're not designing by committee here. We're not seeing what the mother thinks and what the kid thinks and what the brother thinks and what the dad thinks about the color of the room Mm -hmm. and the this and the that. You're doing a discovery process. You are asking them Mm -hmm. the questions that, you know, are important to you to understand about the children's personality and their likes and what their needs are from this, from both a physical, um, you know, medical standpoint, but also um, the, they're, they're reading, gaming, whatever they like, right? But you're not getting right. approval. You're delivering the room no. and everybody's just happy to have it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we set those expectations going in. The first meeting is usually with the family and the child. Um, I take myself and my uh, junior designer or another designer with me. We talk to the child first and talk to them about what they want and what colors. And we hear, well, I want pink and purple and flowers and rainbows and little twinkly lights. And I want (laughs) books and I want to go over here and do art or play with my makeup and my fake makeup. And we usually will take a video of the child explaining, you know, what it is that they're looking for. We might check in with mom. I think my favorite request was um, a little guy who wanted a Batman room and he wanted his whole room painted black. (laughs) And I looked at mom and I said, are you good with that? And she said, anything he wants. Okay. And that is something so you have I to get said, a kind of approval on, right? Yeah. Yeah. I had to get approval on a few things. Um, <laughs> So I said, okay, so that's what we're going to do. You know, they will give us their wish list. Obviously, we will, um, you know, express to them if we have concerns that, you know, interfere any of the design choices that are going to interfere with the overall function of the space. Mm. Um, You know, if they're not very mobile, we're not going to do a bunk bed, right? It's not, that's like little things like that. But for the most part, then we go back, we draft up the room, we take all of the measures that first day, um, we take before video, tons of photos, we go back, we draft it up, we start designing. It's not uncommon for me to tap into some guest designers that I collaborate with throughout our city. So I will ask other designers if they want to help him take on a sibling space with me mm. and volunteer their time. And I've had a few guest designers like Alice Lopez come and help Aww. me uh, with a room and just adore her. And so yes. it gives us a chance to work together on a project. Um, we will put a whole room design together. We will start our ordering. And then we usually tap into our local community on a group page for what we call funded needs, which are items that we're going to likely place in that room. So I will do a call out um, on the page and I'll say, listen, I have a funded need for a lamp. And it kind of looks like this and you can get it on Amazon. <laughs> or I have a funded need for this target bedding. Or I have a funded need over here. Um, anything that I can have the community contribute less than, you know, $50, $75. They are typically amazing. They go within five minutes. Mm. Um, people jumping on and saying, I will sponsor that. I will get this. And they order it for us and they ship it to our showroom. Um, We check it in, we throw it in storage, and then we wait for install day. And then on install day, I'm usually bringing additional inventory that I may not need. Um, But like I said, we are one and done. So if I get there and the room's been cleared out and I notice an air vent or somewhere I can't put that picture that I thought I was going to be able to put that picture. Um, I want the ability to swap something out really Mm, quick that mm. is going to work in that space. So give me two or three pieces of artwork that I know are going to work. 
I will place them in the room. Um, you know, we've got the bedding going, we've got everything laundered, we've got all the new clo- coat hangers for the closets. Um, all of those things, we've we've come with our styling kit. We get there at about 10 in the morning, the last day of install, which is on a Friday. We usually start on a Monday. We have all of our contractors go in that week. And then on Friday, um, you know, we come in that morning and then we do all the finished styling. And then by three o'clock that afternoon, you know, we invite the family in for the big reveal and we take our photos and our video. And um, we usually have a cupcake toast at the end with some sparkling (laughs) cider and it's all good. So we, you know, it is a little bit of a whirlwind, but unlike working with a client directly, you don't have that back and forth approval process. You don't have that. I'm sorry, your item's back ordered. I can't get it for six months. Do you want to wait? It's no, this isn't, this is what we have and Mm. we're going to put this together and we're going to make it work. And so it really is, um, uh, beautiful in that way and that they don't know any different, whether it was this picture or that picture, they don't. Right. You the know, kid uh, might love unicorns right. and maybe you were going to get this one particular unicorn bedding right. and it's back order. So now you get a unicorn picture. Everybody's happy. Yes. We have a unicorn. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> right. So, um, that's, that's what makes it simple in some ways. Um, and so much more, so much less complicated. And what we hear most often when we redo a room is, oh my gosh, I never knew it would look this way. Like, I never knew that was possible. I never Mm. knew you could do that. I never knew that was, like, they don't even have a concept. So when they're telling you what they want, I I would say 90% of our families have, would never even work with a designer. Right. Like, they they, we wouldn't even be a part of their, of what they do. Mm. Um, We're working a lot too with a lot of families that are in financial need. Like I said, it is, we had a family, family whose two children, siblings were sleeping on foam, uh, mm. like egg crates on, on a plywood board. Mm. Um, and so we replaced them with like real mattresses mm-hmm. and we're getting down to some of the basics here. Nice. Um, you know, it's, it's beyond just the aesthetics. It's like the real core basics of what these children need to heal and how they need to live and how they need to be in their spaces that are well organized and, you know, cleaned up and fresh. And I mean, so it's, it's kind of a whole different population that sometimes I think we get, um, kind of myopic in our view of, you know, the, the clients that we work with who are wonderful, don't get me wrong, but there's this whole population that has never had the benefit of doing what we do and they're just blown away, which is completely different. So good. I mean, and the truth is so many of them are on, um, are in financial distress because of the illness. I mean, I have another friend that his, his son is now, my goodness, almost going to be 40 years old. But when he was in, I want to say high school or middle school, he battled a cancer for several years and our friend almost went under, you know, the whole family, like his, he was, he's a self-employed carpenter and him and his wife and the, and the son spent the days and the weeks running back to hospitals for, for, I went on four or five years and he's, he's a one man show carpenter. (laughs) How do you keep a living going doing that? And, um, it's just remarkable. Um, you know, what it isn't just the illness the illness is is unthinkable but it's the ripple effect through the family and the dynamics in ways that unless you know somebody that goes through it you just don't consider you know and so exactly. to sit there and have you know siblings on egg crates somebody outside looking in would be like how could you do that and then in your inside you're like well, I'm trying I'm trying to get some food on the table this week okay because I've yeah. been able to go to work for a month right yeah and yeah. so you really have to evaluate where is the greatest need? Is it going to be in wallpapering the room or getting the mattresses? Mm-hmm. Like you got to, you know, you've got so make much. Make an impact know, that's going to make them better really and happy and healthy, exactly. right? Exactly. Focused on the healing aspects, focused on overall basic needs first. Um, and then we put the pretty in, right. you know, right. and try to try to do those coexisting, but really focused on what do we need to do to make that, make it healthy. And so the thing is that I feel like, and tell me if I'm off a little bit, but I feel like that when, what what you were saying a little while ago when I asked you about if the dream is still there for the 50, one in all the states, I feel like when we talked about this five years ago, it was more 
Yes, that's what I want to do because you focused on the good that it would do. And what I think I heard in there is that it's not that you don't have that dream any longer, but it's a little bit more realistic now in understanding that the, a designer's desire to have a savvy giving chapter is not as is not enough it's like if if they're they it's just what the whole reason for the podcast is making sure that every interior designer has the skills and the tools and the opportunity to better themselves to be a better business person so that they can be profitable but if that's not locked down then you add this other layer to it and both are going to suffer so it's mm -hmm. right it's it's a little bit more like oh okay so not everybody is capable of doing this and everybody might have a many might have a big heart for it might have a desire for it but i feel like i uh, i'm hearing you say the hindsight lesson is that the desire isn't enough right yes and no i think it really depends on what the end goal is if if I, if I have a designer that's been in business for five to seven years and is doing well and really wants to add this layer of, you know, a nonprofit arm to their business, like, you know, this is what we do and we want the ownership over it in our area and we want to invite guest designers in and, and we know how to do this. And our, our board of directors is Dynamo and I've got, you know, a secretary and a treasurer and we're good and I know we can raise money and like, we're good. Um, that, that is still a really, really viable um, uh, operational, you know, structure for mm -hmm. a lot of people. And certainly we've seen success in our chapters that we currently have. Um, and that's one way to go. And we, and I'm not opposed to opening more chapters. We've got the sponsorship houses sponsored many of our chapters across the country, legal fees, which is about 25 to 2,700 a chapter. Wow. And they've been great in, um, sponsoring and covering those costs to further that mission, um, which I'm grateful for, um, because that does relieve a little bit more of a burden, um, for a lot of these chapters. Um, what I realized is that I wanted more. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted more than just a chapter in every state, which if I have one chapter in Texas, obviously they can't cover all of Texas. Mm -hmm. We've got several designers in different areas of Texas. Or, you know, if I have a chapter in California, it's not enough just to have the San Diego. Right. You know, I we would need a Central Coast and we need a North Coast. And then when I started partnering up with Make-A-Wish and realized that they do have chapters everywhere and they're getting these room requests and they have the funding because let's face it, they have a huge name mm -hmm. and a huge fundraising base um, that everybody loves to support, you know, Make-A-Wish. And each of these are run independently. Then it does take... Um, working individually with each of these chapters because they're all run slightly differently and aligning them with a Rolodex of designers to tap into. So for instance, I have a Make-A-Wish chapter in Las Vegas that is working with Anastasia in New Jersey and she's doing an, an e-design for them for them to implement in Las Vegas. Mm. Uh, so they have a child that's in a medical need who has a room wish and Anastasia's like, yeah, I can help. And she has designed the room digitally, sent them all the links for them to do all the purchasing, um, put the whole space together. And the Las Vegas chapter with their volunteers are now going to implement that design plan, which is beautiful. So can imagine if we had a Rolodex of 2000 designers and a Make-A-Wish mm -hmm. chapter calls us and says, we need a designer in Nebraska. Do you have anyone that would be willing to either do an e-design or help us in our state? And I can go through and go, oh, in Nebraska, we have these five designers that have gone through our training so that we hold them to our standards, our savvy giving standards of this is how we do it. We've figured out how to do it. Now I know it's teachable. Now I know other designers can do it. So here's a designer that's been through that we'll align you, let's set up a meeting and we connect the two of them and then they go off. That means that we are just more um, blanketed across the country and we have more resources out there for designers that may want to do a one-off project, don't even know where to start, don't know who to contact at Make-A-Wish, maybe need some extra funds for a sibling space and that's where we can come in and help with that. And then since we've already done it, they kind of know they would know how to do it because mm -hmm. we'll go through that whole training with them. So it really becomes a win-win. And I just want to get more designers into kids spaces um, across the country that can help with that sort of stuff. What I love is that 
you know, we, this is another big lesson of when you grow and scale your business. So is to understand that there's going to be changes, there's going to be pivots, mm -hmm. there's going to be times when you say, you know, my big idea is now looking like this, <laughs> and it became mm -hmm. a different big idea. And I love that is such a great lesson in there, Susan, that you are rolling with the reality of the combination of COVID, the combination of not every designer who has a desire has the built in infrastructure of a board that and, and the fundraising infrastructure, but that there's still a way to make it all work. And so one mm -hmm. of the things that um, I want to understand, because I'm sure designers listening are, I'm sure many are saying, hey, 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 hand up. I'd love to be a part of this. So when you say they're, you're going to train them to do it your way, mm -hmm. do you mean is it online training? Is it, it, do they go and they work with another designer who's doing a room? And in that training, are you talking about specifically things like we don't get in the weeds and get approval on all things? Like what types mm -hmm. of training are you offering? Uh, the way that we've done it is through Zoom. So we kind of quote unquote certify. And I say that loosely because we are not accredited through any institution or anything. This is just me <laughs> saying, listen, I you got to pass my test. <laughs> yeah, pass the test. <laughs> um, we've been through our hour and a hour and a half, you know, Zoom training. So we got a group of designers. Our last one that we did, we had about six to eight designers on there. Um, I walk through what it is that we do, and there's a lot of things that aren't necessarily intuitive right off the bat. Mm. Questions to ask the family, you know, how they're living. You know, a, a lot of things like, for instance, rarely will I put a twin bed unless requested into a child's room. Why? When a child is sick and ill. Oftentimes Mom wants to lay down with them, right? <laughs> they want to lay down, right? And so you want to cuddle up next to your child. Mm. You don't want to cuddle on a twin bed because oftentimes you might be, I've seen parents sleep on the floor next mm. to their child's bed because they haven't had a place to sleep. So we, we want to think about all of these things that are like, okay, we want to use organic fabrics and organic sheets, or we want to use solid surface floors and we want to keep the allergens off. We want to do this, that, and the other. There's so many little things that I've learned over the years, um, little takeaway key points and things that I want to incorporate in their wellness design that I believe are important. Um, and so I want to go through all of those. And then, like you said, we don't go back and ask, you know, it's so easy to get mired down as a designer into that back and forth approval process. We do that with our clients all the time, unless you set limits and boundaries over how many revisions you're going to go through, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where people get stuck doing hourly and not flat fees because they haven't set that limit and boundary of how much revising I'm going to do. And I shouldn't have to do revising if I did all my design discovery with you. There should mm -hmm. be no revisions. We right. should already be. So, <laughs> you know, there's that. Preach. Yeah. So <laughs> thing that I sometimes need to remind people like, no, 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 like you're going to design it. And these are the elements that I want you to look for. And these are going to be your high impact items. These are going to be your health and wellness items. These are going to be, you know, the, the how you're going to get your products and your things in there. And this is typically what an, an overall installation week would look like and a service order would look like so that by this time on Friday afternoon, you're here. Mm. And then we have all of the forms and paperwork. So we have all the legal documents as far as contracts for families to realize that, hey, we're coming in here as volunteers. And so, you know, we're doing the best that we can. We're, we're trying to make sure everything's safe, but you can't hold us liable. Um, you know, we're going to have, um, you know, a volunteer agreement in place with the Make-A-Wish chapter and a memorandum of understanding with them that we have them sign um, that understands that we may be coming in and doing the sibling space and that is an in-kind donation and how to do some of the accounting for it. Um, so there's a lot of like the nuts and bolts of it, I would say, the mm. logistics. And then there's just the practicality and the process. And then there is really setting those limits and boundaries over, okay, you're going to be doing an e-design and this is what you're going to want to include in an e-design. Mm. Uh, you know, these are the things that you want to do to give a complete package. So we always talk about how, you know, the build packages that you give a builder, right? Well, there's like, this is the best practice standard. Here's a slide deck. Here's all the things that you need to put in there. You know, you need to put your storyboard and the room measurements and then the layouts. And sadly, a lot of people don't know that, you know, mm. and so, 
you know, that may be what we kind of teach and say, okay, we're going to be doing this, this, and this. Most designers on whole that come to our program or come and want to volunteer have been fairly established and in business and pretty much know what they're doing. Um, so it's not a huge deal, but having them go through that kind of quote unquote certification, if you will, <laughs> adds that level of comfort on my end if we're putting our name behind it mm -hmm. to make sure that the end user is going to have a good experience and that it's going to be a win-win for both Make-A-Wish because we want to present our best foot forward in aligning with them. We take that very, you know, uh, we're honored to be uh, partnering with them and that they trust us enough. So I want to make sure anybody that we send to them is reputable, um, talented, um, understands how to do an installation. And uh, we want to make sure that that's a, a good partnership. I love it. I love it. I mean, it's it's it makes so much sense that you would have established basically a roadmap for success mm -hmm. because there are all of the nuances that you just mentioned that are just a tiny little, you know, some are in uh, similarity to the way you run a typical design project and some are different. And mm -hmm. why, why, why you don't need 2000 designers out there reinventing the wheel on how to do this when you've been doing it for seven years and you know the success um, you know, the, the steps to, su to success. So good for you. But I remember right. uh, from the beginning, you know, you're all about your systems and you're all about your processes. And I remember um, when you first came on the show and I, you were talking about how to then, you were literally at that moment, if I recall, figuring out how to make it this big overall system and plan to open a savvy giving chapter so that it could be something that you could duplicate and scale. And mm -hmm. um, here you yeah. are doing a different iteration of it. And congratulations mm -hmm. for the association, especially with, like you said, make a wish. That is huge that they yeah. would look at you and regard you as a worthy partner, as somebody that, because, you know, like you want to make sure that the designers that you recommend recommend for these rooms around the country for Make-A-Wish are going to do your reputation honor. You know, Make-A-Wish is not selecting you willy-nilly either, Susan. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So uh, congratulations. It's it's Thank really you. something what you've been able to achieve. And, and for me to watch you do it alongside running the size firm that you do is beyond. You run two companies, essentially. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, I've been very fortunate. And then again, going right back to that um, hiring process, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have certainly prior to that implementing that I had had two, um, uh, actually three people in an associate director position, uh, one who's still on our board who I adore, um, but she moved and two others that I burned through that were not fits. Um, mm -hmm. And to have finally in the position now, uh, with that hiring process in place and going through that, um, I have a fantastic associate director who was soon to become executive director and take over this whole show and let me come in as an adjunct <laughs> just design. <laughs> uh, and I love her to pieces and she's phenomenal. And so it is really that next step is you want to, you want to build something that's going to be beyond you and you want to be able to walk away from it and know that it's still going to have a life, especially a nonprofit, um, that is going to continue to grow and flourish and be able to have the longevity. So many, just like businesses, so many nonprofits fail after a couple of years. And I knew we were coming up on that seven year itch mark, you know, mm. and seven years is about when either you decide to fold or you make it mm. and you have to make a conscious decision. And believe me, I have thought a million times about, oh, is this really what I want to do? Is this how I really want to push and put time and energy into it? And I just feel so passionately about the fact that we as designers have so much talent to give and, and, and we have an ability to have an impact on a young person that will sustain them for years and years and years mm. to come both in memory and both in just the, the physical um, being cared for in that way and the most intimate place, which is their room. Um, you have such an impact on a child's life or in another family's life that if I can partner that up with those families and be the conduit and give the structure to doing that and then train somebody else to do what I do to keep that going, then that to me is thrilling. And that is really that passion project in me that um, I'm unwilling to let go because it just, once you've had, you've talked to these families a couple of years later, or 
like the other day was my birthday and I got a text from a parent who lost her child um, that we had made over his room. And he, she sent me the video of him singing me happy birthday from a few years ago. Mm. And honestly, it just stopped me in my tracks. I was having a bad day mm. and, you know, you get overwhelmed and you're stressed about the plumbing fixtures not coming until July. And you're like, oh my gosh. And to get that text and have that impact on a, you know, years later when her son has passed mm. and for her to have reached out and sent that to me meant everything. Mm. And it was just, those are the moments in your life, those inflection points that you reflect back on your career or on your talents or what you do with your life. And to me, that is so satisfying that I don't want to just let that go. So that's, we're pushing in a couple different, we will still be opening chapters and we will still be growing this pop-up designer program. And we will still be looking at giving Tuesday to raise the majority of our funds, um, to support these other designers and chapters in doing the sibling spaces and the extra rooms and stuff. So giving Tuesday, this November 30th is going to be huge for us because we've got a huge ask of 50,000 this year Whoa, and yeah. it's, it's going to be aggressive, but you know, go big or go home. Right? So you gotta, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta do it. You just gotta shoot for the moon, land in the stars. Well, I have to tell you, I can't do math. All right. You know, I can't do math. So maybe you could help me out. But if we yeah. have 10,000 designers listening, what do we all have yeah. to give to get to 50,000? Like, I don't even know how to do it. Is that horrible? Five dollars. Five That's it? Five dollars? Oh, my God. We Everybody should get you to 50,000 easy. Come on. Exactly. I mean, exactly. we should. I yeah, I'm I need glad five, you could do ten thousand dollar donors, or I need you know ten thousand yeah. five dollar donors. That's it. That's it. That's yeah. it. Oh my goodness! And so, so, so two things I want to know before you go, and one thing I want to say to you before you go is, your passion is so contagious, and I just Thank respect and, and admire you so much for all the reasons. And this, this, this is a big one as, as well. All right, so. Giving Tuesday, I want you to yes. tell us how we give to you. And I also want you to tell us how designers who want to be part of that 2000 designers on a Rolodex can. And do, does anybody know what a Rolodex is besides I our know. generation? <laughs> I'm probably dating myself, huh? <laughs> Our network. Well, you know, we are. It's all about what you preach all the time, Luann, which is collaboration over competition, mm -hmm. right? We're all in this together. We're all working together. Um, you know, Giving Tuesday is coming up on November 30th. We do have a big ask. Um, we will have a designated link just for Giving Tuesday that you can find on our national page on Facebook. Um, we'll have it linked on our website, which is SavvyGivingByDesign.org. And then, um, you know, we're, we're just going to be going big and asking for donations. Um, as far as getting involved, definitely filling out an inquiry on the website at SavvyGivingByDesign.org, uh, messaging me on Instagram, and I'll give you uh, the email address. Um, you know, it, filling out an inquiry, let's get you guys trained. We're going to be doing trainings probably once a month um, starting in 2022. I know we've got one already coming up in December. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll get those networks together and, and just really build that online design community, um, so that we can tap into you when that time comes and we can introduce you to the local make wish. And if you do want to have a chapter and you want to take it that step further, um, you know, talk to some of our other chapter leaders and certainly, you know, let's have a conversation. I've got some, uh, videos that kind of go through, uh, some of, you know, what's involved in having a chapter that we can send along. So there are a lot of different ways to get involved. Love it. I love it. Now, do we have to wait until the Tuesday, November 30th for Giving Tuesday, or we can go to the website now and, 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 and donate? Go to the website now. You can, <laughs> you can donate anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And then just so I'm clear, what happens is when, when we donate to your national site, then you're disseminating that to the designers and the different chapters that are working with Make-A-Wish and different things and helping them get that work done. That's what's happening, right? Yes and no. Okay. Um, so what we're doing is the national chapter um, has funds that primarily support the San Diego market. However, we do grant for the pop-up program. Each chapter is their own 501c3 and handles their own financial donation. So if there's a chapter in your state that you prefer to donate to, if you're in Florida or Georgia or Alabama, um, you can find the chapter local to you mm -hmm. and donate, and those funds will stay in that community. Okay. And are the different chapters that are established through the country listed on your national site? Yes. 
Like, how will I know if there's a chapter in my particular state, in other words? It, it's on our website. Good. So okay. you'll be able to see all the chapters are linked and the chapter names and, uh, and the points of contact. Um, each, what the fundraising we're going to do this year for Giving Tuesdays in lieu of our annual gala, but it's also because we want to support the pop-up designer program. We want to be there, um, and help, uh, provide funds for the, some of the sibling spaces and come in and be able to do that with Make-A-Wish. Like I said, the one difference between Make-A-Wish and our organization is if we do get a room referral um, to one of our chapters, we do the primary child and the sibling space where Make-A-Wish just does the primary child. So we wanna come in and make sure that those pop-up designers have some resources available to them to help do a modified makeover for a sibling. Okay, okay, great. So that's where donating to your yeah. chapter, you're gonna help the pop-ups, okay. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. Well, you know what? Come on, guys. Seriously. <laughs> this is like such a cool thing that you do. Such a passion project, as we said a moment ago. And of course, for the designers that already have their chapters, we mentioned a couple and um, they're just outstanding, you know, ladies that are giving are. their time and energy and heart to this endeavor. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's awesome. It really is something else. Susan, I have to say, thank you so much oh, for coming here you. and telling us all about this and for just, you know, giving you and me the chance to catch up. And, uh, I am just looking forward to seeing, you know, what you create and what you do over the coming years, because you are a dynamo and I'm so grateful to be in your world. Well, Luann, I can't thank you enough. Honestly, you have been the impetus for so many of our chapter leaders even hearing about us and to have this venue and to have you as such a leader in our industry is I'm just so thrilled that I get to know you. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Now, Susan talked about the challenges of running the nonprofit, which, as it turns out, are uncannily similar to running her interior design business, right? In business, Susan surrounds herself with efficient and driven employees. In her nonprofit, Susan collaborates with the best interior designers in our industry, and she has partnered with Make-A-Wish to expand her reach by delivering makeover surprises to the children who need it most, right? Susan and I have both experienced the challenge of hiring the right people for the right job, especially especially challenging when you are slammed and under pressure, which let's face it, isn't that exactly when we typically hire when we are strung out and our backs are against the wall, right? And we too have also both experienced the difficulty of letting people go. But you learn, you will be happier. And you also learn that your employees, the ones that show up and do excellent work, are happier too when that anchor weight has been lifted or offloaded, as this case may be, right? The thing to learn from this is this. You are the leader. You are the one who has to make the decision and execute on the decision. And the thing is, I need you to understand, it never gets easy, but it does get easier, right? It's like running 10 miles. The first time you run 10 miles, the whole thing is a mind bending experience of how many more miles are left? How many more miles are left, right? The 20th time that you do it though, it's like, okay, there's seven more miles. Just keep it moving. I got this, right? So it doesn't get easy, but it gets easier. And with each time you will look back and see how it positively impacts your business and the rest of the team that's there when you make these hard decisions, okay? Now, Susan has duplicated her hiring processes and her standards in her nonprofit, Savvy Giving by Design. This has allowed her to expand her charitable reach. And because her business is mirrored in her passion project, that same level of training, structure, and vision is shared among the interior designers who have opened Savvy Giving by Design chapters across the country, as well as these little pop-up chapters that Susan was talking about, right? In honor of children in medical crisis, and as a way to give thanks for our own families, our health, and our successful businesses, please think about contributing to Savvy Giving by Design this Giving Tuesday. If you are listening real time, that date for this year is Tuesday, November 30th, 2021. And if you are listening in the future on any day, keep in mind, 
Any day can be Giving Tuesday. If you are moved by Susan and her work, reach out, donate, and possibly consider running a pop-up savvy giving room for a deserving child in your community. If you're interested, fill out the inquiry form by going to SavvyGivingByDesign.org or message Susan Winterstein on Instagram. All right. So I cannot end without thanking Susan for all that she does and also for thanking our sponsor, Rebel Woods. Of course, Rebel Woods offers a line of handcrafted and custom curated premium hardwood and resilient flooring that looks amazing and has the features that Susan is looking for in her Savvy Giving by Design makeovers. So if you too want easy to clean flooring for your allergen-free home and environment, check out Rebel Woods and think about becoming a Rebel Woods trade designer today. Learn more at revelwoods.com. So thank you, thank you for joining me today. I just loved having this conversation with Susan. I hope you did too. And I hope that you were inspired, whether it's to join the Savvy Giving by Design organization in some way or doing something on your own, something that maybe is personal to you. But bringing that love, that spark, that energy that you have for design somewhere, some way, touching somebody else. Okay? Thanks tons. Decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.